please welcome to the stage panel one, maternal and infant health, where we've come from and where we're going. Our moderator serving today is Stacy Braybor, Senior Vice President of Public Policy and Government Affairs, March of Dimes. The Honorable Muriel Bowser, Mayor of Washington, D.C. Angelina Spicer, comedian, actress, and activist. Dr. Robin Jones, Senior Medical Director, Women's Health and Office of the Chief Medical Officer, Johnson & Johnson. And Dr. Layla Alkito, Attending Physician, Children's National Division of Neonatal Tology and Children's National. So good afternoon, everyone. I am pleased to be here today with each and every one of you and everyone here and have the opportunity to moderate this conversation with such a distinguished panelist. At March of Dimes, advancing the health of the mom and the baby is the core at the core of each and everything we do each and every day. We do this through our programs, we do this through our research, and we do this through, most importantly, our partnerships. Our nation continues to face a maternal and infant health crisis, and one that has been compounded by economics, as well as the health impact of COVID-19. Do you know each and every day in the US, we have two women who die from complications of childbirth and pregnancy, and two babies that die every two hours, every day. And far too many, and far too much, and too often, those are moms and babies of color. We've made significant progress here in the district, and I'm sure that everyone in here, and here on this panel that joined me will agree that there's still a lot of work that we all can do together through partnership. We've made significant progress, and let me share with you the latest report that comes from the report card that is published by the March of Dimes annually, specifically for Washington, D.C. I'll share two, two statistics with you. Premature births in the district have improved to a high from a high of 11 per 1,000 live births a decade ago to just recently last year, 10.4. The second statistic, white women have a premature birth rate of 9.4 per 1,000, while the number for African Americans is even greater. It's 13.4. Now, in addition to that, there are many challenges that we face and that women face in regards to being able to have access to affordable, not only affordable, but access to prenatal and maternal care services. They live great distances, and because they live great distances, it is difficult for them to be able to go and travel to get the maternal care and the prenatal services that they should have. And what I'm happy to share with you is that today, here in Washington, D.C., and also in Southeast Ohio, March of Dimes has partnered with Reckon Infa to put together a package of profiles and bond of a launch of programs that we're calling Better Starts for All. And together through this program and partnering with March of Dimes and Reckoned, together we're bringing support education, we're bringing clinical care to those pregnant people and new moms throughout the area. And we're doing this creatively 
We're calling it Moms and a Baby Mobile Health Unit, health centers. These are health centers that travel throughout the community. So we're going to the community so that we can bring these services to these women. We'll share more about that with you at the Mayor's Summit, her, her post-event, which is a mommy mixer. And that mommy mixer is next Monday, September the 20th. And it's gonna be at the Saddle East, the Saddleless Southeast location. So hopefully we'll be able to see all of you there. Again, the mommy mixer. Now, I'm excited to jump right into this conversation and talk to our distinguished panels. And so let's begin. Let's talk about how we can work together. So Mayor Bowser, my first question is going to go to you. We hear so much news about maternal mortality and morbidity across the United States. What is the status of maternal and infant health in the district, and what are some of the challenges? Well, thank you for that uh, introduction, and also thank you for the wonderful work that the March of Dimes is doing in the district, not just um, in the time that we've been uh, hosting this summer, but you must be 100 years old, uh, the organization. So we appreciate all that the March of Dimes is doing, but also recognizing um, the need to pivot in this space uh, and to make sure that we're talking about the, the issues that are affecting black and brown communities across our country, um, but also as a nation, why are we behind other develop, developed nations in the world um, in the experience uh, for moms and babies? So you've talked about uh, some of the numbers that we know impact the health of, of moms and babies, um, prematurity being um, one, of, one of the big ones. And we too follow um, the ratings of live births and how, um, how we're faring in the city. And any baby, we, we want to be able to, to, to live. Like Dr. Nesbitt said, through their first birthday and beyond. So one child lost in childbirth or one mom negatively impacted in childbirth is, is one too many. We have seen, as you've noted, since 2007, the, the mortality rates be halved to the positive, and that's a good thing. Uh, so where we were at 13, over 13 per 1,000 births, we're now, uh, I think, somewhere at around seven um, mortalities per 1,000 births. So that's a good thing. You also mentioned how stubborn the number is to come down. And so all of the things that we're doing, we have to stay focused on because over time and compound it with each other, uh, we know that that impacts the health of moms and babies. We uh, have been a very focused, as you've heard in some of the videos on the prematurity number, uh, moms having access to care from the earliest point um, in their pregnancy and after um, their pregnancies to make sure that we can pour into a healthy start um, for our youngest Washingtonians, and we'll continue to do that. But more largely, um, in what we focus on is not just the health care part of healthy babies, but all of the social determinants of how healthy women will be and when they go uh, on their pregnancy journey. And so that is uh, a, a huge uh, part that we'd like to talk more about how affordable housing is healthcare, how having access to healthy food is, is healthcare, and how women um, having a supportive home environments well, with good paying jobs and access to leave um, is also part of how to have healthy babies. Thank you. And Ms. Spicer, let me ask you this question. How does your story and work add more to this conversation around maternal and infant health? Well, thank you so much, Mayor Bowser, for having me. Um, I am, I, I feel like the unicorn on this panel uh, <laughs> because I don't have a medical degree. Um, I have a, a BFA from Howard University, so, uh, Big up to HU. Um, yes, absolutely. But I am a stand-up comedian. Uh, I'm a stand-up comedian. I'm an actress. I'm a social media influencer. Um, and I 
planned to have my baby, to answer your question. Uh, I planned to have my daughter six years ago now uh, with my husband. I mentioned that I'm married because a lot of times people assume the black women don't have husbands. But I married uh, my husband and I planned on having our baby, uh, but we did not plan on me having a perceived traumatic birth, nor did we plan for me to get severe postpartum depression. Um, after I had my daughter, I, you know, I thought I did everything the right way. You know, I went to all of my prenatal visits. I had a good relationship with my OBGYN. Uh, you know, I had a stable relationship. We're homeowners. You check off the list. We thought we did it in the right way. We planned it. Um, but I was so blindsided by just the physical pain that I was in. And I won't go into the gory details. You got to come to the comedy show for that. <laughs> but I was just so blindsided by the pain and how wrecked my body felt and the responsibility of now being someone's mother. And people always say, oh, no one can, no one can prepare you. No one can prepare you. No, ma'am, they can't, OK? And mentally, I was just, I, I felt like my mind left the building. I, and I say that jokingly, but seriously, I felt like the world turned gray. And where I'd usually seen things in vibrant colors and funny, and I had just lost my sense of self. I describe it as I felt like my old self died. And I was mourning my old life. And I tried everything. I tried, I had a relationship with a therapist, so I continued with my therapy. Um, I started going back to church again. I tried to pray it away, because I'm black, and black people tell you, pray it away. So I tried that. I tried speaking to the women in my family. I tried, you know, turning to social media groups that I'm a part of, and my social connections, and nothing helped. So ultimately, at eight months postpartum, my therapist recommended that I check into a psychiatric facility for treatment. And that was the best gift that she or anyone could have given me. Because I was able for 10 days to check into this magical facility that felt like a vacation. OK. It felt like I was at Sandals, all inclusive to the Bahamas. I didn't have to wipe diaper, I wipe a butt. I didn't have to change diapers. I didn't have to look at my husband's face. I could sleep. I could take a shower. I could comb my hair. I was like, ooh. Old Angelina is back. She's here. So I, that was the gift that I didn't know that I needed. And I'm so thankful that I had access to care, uh, that I had a therapist who checked in on me and followed up and made sure that I was healthy and cared for. I'm thankful that my mom used, was able to use FMLA and literally drop grab her purse and hop on a plane to Los Angeles where I live. Um, and she stayed for four weeks to help my husband and I transition. Um, it was just such a beautiful gift. So now I'm really on a mission to normalize the conversation around maternal mental health and normalize the conversation about what it's really like after you have a baby, okay? Because it's not in a book. It's not in a manual. It is literally the stories from our experiences that will really help push this conversation forward. So I call it the hashtag postpartum revolution. Um, we've been on a national tour. I've met with lawmakers. And I'm really just looking to push the needle to normalize this conversation by way also of a documentary film that I'm working on. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And so now I pose the question to you, Dr. Jones, and as well as to you, Dr. Quito. As practitioners, what is missing from the narrative about the state of maternal and infant health? I think Mayor Bowser, Bowser touched on it when she referred to those social determinants of health. It's where we're born, where we grow, where we live, where we work, where we play. Every one of those parameters impacts our wellness and the health care we receive. 
let's talk about where we live, the environment. If you live in the inner city and you don't always have access to electricity, don't always have access to water that may be lead free, don't always have access to transportation because you don't own a car and you have to get to the medical center that maybe is only 10 miles away, but you don't have access or car fare to get there, that's an access issue. And that's due to your environment where you live, to the, I call it right now, the eternal racism that exists here in the United States, the haves and the have nots, no pun intended, and recognizing that each one of these really determines how well we can be. Where you grow, and when I say grow, it's where you're educated and whether you have access to it or not. And we're here in an urban environment, the same thing impacts those in a rural environment who don't have the economic access that they should have to be able to be successful and have a healthy lifestyle and provide the same for their families. And each one of those parameters impacts a woman's ability to have a long, healthy pregnancy. And Mayor Bowser referenced let's, you know, what's going on in this country. The United States is the only developed country in the world that has an increasing maternal mortality rate. It has the highest mortality rate for mothers more than any other developed country in the world. Think about that for a minute. Aren't we the richest country in the world? How can we possibly have the highest maternal mortality rate? And who's being impacted? Women that look like me. We are three to four times more likely to die related to a pregnancy than white women are here in the United States. And it's certainly worse, those numbers get higher depending where you live in the United States. And you think about that being, okay, that must be deep south. You know, it can't possibly be in a developed city where I live or a state where I live. Well, within those top five states, certainly those, you know, the usual players that you might think because of, you know, where people live in a more rural habitat, such as Louisiana and Georgia, but New Jersey's in that top five also. And there are other major states on the East Coast that are not far behind. That should not be happening. And in order for us to really address that, it is about advocacy. It is about political change. And there's a number of ways to approach that, and I know we'll be talking some more, so I'll leave that um, till later. Um, thank you. I think everyone has actually answered the question already, so thank you. Bye-bye. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> um, I first want to thank Mayor Bowser and her team for putting together this excellent summit. It's a great opportunity for us to come together and discuss these issues. It's Truly an honor to be here and to represent Children's National. Um, I think you asked an excellent question about what's missing from the narrative. I 100% agree with what's been said before. I think one, as Ms. Spicer said, the stories are missing. Often we're bombarded with a lot of statistics, um, but just to humanize it, it's so important to hear stories like that that were shared. Um, secondly, I agree the social determinants of health definitely it's something that should be emphasized. Um, and and, and whenever I'm bombarded with these statistics, it's important for me to hear the next step, which is the why. And that is something that I think is often missing. Uh, we, we hear the stats, but, but rarely are there um, recommendations or proposals or ideas, hypotheses of why we think some of these issues exist. Uh, particularly when it comes to the healthcare disparities that we see that affect black and brown women and babies. Um, I think it is important for us to recognize the role of systemic racism, things like implicit bias as well, and how they all may play a role in some of these negative health outcomes that we're seeing. Um, I'll take implicit bias as an example, and this is that idea that 
we act and we do things based on subconscious stereotypes that we have. And in the healthcare arena, how does that play out? That could be me as a physician. I could recommend one treatment plan to, to a particular person and someone else who has the same condition but looks differently from, from a different background, different race subconsciously. There are some stereotypes there that I have and I recommend or withhold a certain uh, treatment plan for that person. That's how implicit bias plays a role in healthcare and undoubtedly we know that this has some effects on some of our health outcomes, particularly when it comes to mothers and infants. So when I, when I read these statistics, when I hear about the disparities that exist, I'm really looking for an answer. I'm looking for the why. And I think it's really important that we look upstream and some of our, it, it had those issues kind of addressed. So thank you. Thank you. So the second question, and actually uh, doc, all of you have addressed it, and Dr. Jones, you spoke to it as well. And so I'm going to phrase the question, and I'm going to start with you, Dr. Akito. It is, we know that maternal infant health isn't solely clinically determinants. And I think Dr. Jones spoke to it in terms of just social determinants as well. Dr. Okito, could you share a bit about factors impacting neonatal health outcomes? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I think as, as mentioned before, the social determinants of health play a, a big role in the outcomes that we see, not only for adults, but also for the neonates as well. Um, as was mentioned, prematurity is the leading cause of mortality and morbidity for, for infants. Um, so when we think of that, we think of what are the causes of prematurity. As mentioned before, it is the, these outcomes are closely and intimately related to the health care and the health that the mother has, the birthing parent's health. It clearly has a, uh, an impact on rates of prematurity. So when we're looking at, at this, we have to decide, are the mothers receiving high quality and early prenatal care? Even before that, looking even more upstream, we know that a mother's health, even prior to becoming pregnant, plays a role in her pregnancy and the outcome of it. So when we think of prematurity, we have to think of the mother's health, the birthing parent's health, the, moving a little bit forward, we know that statistically where a preterm infant is born has an impact on their outcome as well. So when we, we have to consider the quality of care that's being provided at the hospital. So where you're born plays a role and that is part of the social determinants of health as well. Thereafter, we, we look at the environment that an infant goes into. And when I say environment, this is all encompassing. So we're talking about where the child lives, the physical space of where the baby will be. Is the, what, are, what are the sleeping habits of the baby? We all know that safe sleeping habits is intimately related to survival of infants. And we really need to practice safe, safe sleeping habits. Um, what is the air quality? Is this baby being exposed to secondhand smoke? or air pollution. We know that all of these issues related to the social determinants of health impact the outcome of infants. The, when I think of environment, I think about the parents, the mental health of the parents. This in itself also will affect the development of the child and, and the future for that child as well. So there, there are a number of factors. I think that we can be here for an hour really listing off all of the issues that, that can impact the a neonates' out, uh, health outcomes, but the, the umbrella of it is certainly the social determinants of health certainly need to be addressed. Thank you. And Mayor Bowser? My question is to you. Can you talk a bit about investments that your administration has made here to overcome birthing for people, babies, and their families? Well, what, as I was listening to the doctor go through um, that, that long list, I, I was kind of ticking off in my head. Um, since we've been having this discussion, we all like to see each other, that's fine. But what we really want is to make sure that we're following up on what we're learning uh, and we're using, you know, the, the, just the vast resources of our government um, to, to make things better. Uh, we're 700,000 people who live here. We just approved a $17 billion budget. Uh, we have 96% of our people have health insurance. I think that makes us number two in the nation for people uh, who are insured. Um, and we have 
health care facilities in every part of our ward. Uh, of our of our city in all eight wards, and so sometimes when uh, we talk about um, that, uh, you know, the kind of the health outcomes and the health disparities that exist in our city, I literally want to pull my hair out um, because we invest so much and we want people not only to take advantage of it, um, but for their interactions with the system to be effective and for the outcomes to improve. Um, that's that's all of what uh, we are in this for. And so the, the one investment that I'll talk a little bit more about yesterday that I know is different from when we started having this discussion is um, a quality home visitation um, that may address what Ms. Spicer is talking about um, in, because I appreciate her sharing her story because it is, as everybody says, it's wonderful to have a baby, but I think that everybody has probably also had the experience of like, oh, what yes. am I doing? Uh, so a lot of people have, let me put it that way. And so um, that conversation can happen um, between a, a, a new mom and a family and a professional who's who's been to that rodeo, um, who can assure a, a mom um, and a family that uh, these resources are uh, available to you. And they're vast resources um, that, that can be uh, available. It's also important uh, for us to, to emphasize, um, when we started having this conversation, we were seriously concerned. Um, and it was the decision of uh, Dr. Nesbitt that the, the, the quality of care being delivered at one of our hospitals for delivery and new moms wasn't up to where we needed it to be. And we had to transition away from it. Uh, and we spent uh, the rest of that time making sure that moms and families expected parents were uh, connected to um, both the specialized care and the prenatal care that they needed. Um, but we also were very focused on how we were going to bring those services um, back to Ward 8. That's why we are so uh, excited uh, that we uh, will be opening our, our hospital on the schedule that uh, we have uh, announced, uh, that we have an outstanding partner, um, uh, that the operators of George Washington University Hospital are going to operate the hospital at the St. Elizabeth's campus. Uh, and today we've been talking about Children's National, who's um, been uh, affiliated with United Medical Center for many, many years, uh, is going to uh, operate uh, the, the emergency services uh, and the neonatal services uh, at our new hospital at St. Elizabeth. So all of those things are part um, of the puzzle. But I, I don't think the doctors would mind me saying this. Uh, that they don't really want to see the kids in the hospital, you know, right? You don't want to see them in the hospital. So the system of care that we're building so that people can take advantage um, of services as they're thinking about having a baby and, uh, and beyond are going to be um, very, very important for us. And you can see everybody nodding their head. This, yes. is, this is great, Mayor. This is great. And I will pivot and take the next question to you, Mrs. Spicer. Your work combines advocacy and comedy. Tell us more about how your legislative work has allowed you to support maternal mental health. Well, I call myself an accidental activist because I was fine cracking jokes. Uh, I was fine going to comedy clubs, you know, working TV shows and doing my thing. Uh, but again, I was just so blindsided by this experience that I was like, Some, someone has to say something. Somebody's got to do something about this. You know, because in my case, with postpartum depression, severe postpartum depression and anxiety, I felt like it could have been prevented. And I felt like the severity of my illness could have been prevented. So. My goal, honestly, was free moms. Free moms who are scrolling Instagram, who are on Twitter, who, are, who follow me on TikTok. You know, my goal was just for, for them to see themselves in my experience. But an organization approached me after seeing some of my content online and asked if I would, if I would join them 
on a legislative visit up, up to Sacramento, California. And I went, I met with lawmakers, and I was like, this, I was like, this is my jam. Okay, I can actually go and I can actually, thank you. I can actually go into an office where people are not expected to hear jokes, crack them up, and then get them to like do what we want. <laughs> so I met with a bunch of legislators in Sacramento, California, um, and I was a part of a team and we helped pass three new laws. Right. Three new bills of legislation. <laughs> to help the mamas. I was like, yes, this is it. So now in California, moms have to be screened. I'm like, why is this rocket science? Why do we have to beg and plead for a mama to be screened by her health professional? So now mothers in California have to be screened. They have to be screened during and after pregnancy. If someone had screened me when I was getting one of those NSTs, Oh, Lord, you could have saved me a trip to the psych ward, honey. That's right. But that's all right, because it was fun. But anyway, uh, the second piece of legislation that I helped work on was to, uh, to train uh, physicians and labor and delivery staff on how to actually implement these, train these screenings. Uh, and I've worked with Cedar sinai Hospital in Los Angeles, uh, Los Robles Hospital in Los Angeles. Now I work with doctors and stuff. I'm like, OK, this is kind of cool, right? Uh, and the third piece of legislation was uh, to collect the data and have a uh, resource center or a database to refer my, uh, women to when they show signs that they're in crisis or that, they're need, that they need additional care. So those were the bills. And now I am on, uh, what's it called? I, I want to, uh, y'all gave me a mic. Okay. So now I'm screaming at everybody. I'm like, okay. Somebody check on the mamas. We need this kind of legislation across the country. So now I'm working with um, Congresswoman Lisa Blunt Rochester on her Momnibus uh, package, which I know that March of Dimes is, is a huge supporter of. And I really want to work on federal legislation to get the same level of care that we have in California across the country. It's not fair that mamas in Mississippi or in Louisiana are not being screened. It's a simple thing. So that's what I'm doing with the legislation piece. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question. If COVID-19 has, has taught us anything, it is one, that timeliness of accurate public health information is so important. And two, the trust in public health can save our lives. We've learned from this pandemic we can use, what can we learn and what have we learned from this pandemic that we can use to improve the outcomes for our moms and our babies? And Mayor, I'm gonna direct this question to you first. Well, um, see if I'm on. Okay, um, I love that question because we're coming out of, um, or I, I'm saying we're coming out because I believe that we're coming out of this with COVID. Yes, and, um, but it's been 18 months and it's been, uh, if you talk to anybody who sat in my seat before, and I know um, our medical professionals, I just, I had no idea that we would be here 18 months. You know, you know when we looked at other pandemics, sometimes it's two years. Um, I just didn't believe it. Uh, but here we are. And uh, I say this, when we talk about public health officials as a mayor, I knew that I had a great department in DC Health. I did know that. I especially knew that we had a great director. But they have performed in a way that is so exceptional um, that DC residents should be extremely proud. And I know I'm proud as their boss. So I want to thank DC Health. Let's give them a big yeah. round of applause. But DC residents have also uh, performed exceptionally. Um, they believe in science. Um, they trust the, the government. Um, they verify what we say. Um, but they have followed public health guidelines. And as a result, I firmly believe um, 
that our first goal was to flatten the curve, which they did, which gave our medical professionals the ability to have hospitals prepared, the PPE they needed um, to continue to serve people who are having babies at the same time, um, serve people who are suffering um, from COVID. Uh, so we were able to do that. So I know that all of the work that we did, um, we were able to save lives. Another group of um, government folks that I want to highlight and acknowledge is our communications teams, not only in the health department, but for people who work for people like me, like mayors and public officials who were out in front every day talking about scientific information um, and made it possible for us to do it in a way that was understandable. So I will give a big, big shout out to EOM comms and all of the comms professionals in DC government. But um, we learn things about public health, but we're also applying those lessons in other areas. Um, we are applying lessons learned to gun violence, for example, where we've set up an emergency operations center where the public health officials have been supported by uh, other outstanding public service in the government uh, to, uh, to get work done. So that, that has been um, a very, very important lesson learned from COVID, how important it is uh, when there's not an emergency to have outstanding people preparing for the emergency when it happens. And that's what we had in, in DC Health. Uh, but also having the government being able to pivot on a dime to support um, our lead agency uh, in, in that example. But the other benefit I think that our medical professionals uh, put on display is that interventions work. The thing that COVID showed us is that we can model it, um, we can define an intervention, whether it's mask wearing or social distancing or hand washing. We can apply it and we can watch what it does to the curve. I firmly believe that that is applicable to just any kind of pub public problem. Um, and sometimes the curves move slower or sometimes we can literally watch an intervention and 20 days later to see what it does to um, our experience with COVID. Uh, and how we talk about it consistently, um, forthrightly, and um, I have learned as mayor, and I appreciate the support of DC residents and businesses in this, but we told them the truth, we told them what they needed to do, and they did it. Um, and we had the support of the medical community in saying, this is the science, this is what works, and we're gonna show you how it works. And um, I think that's applicable in so many ways. Thank you. Dr. Quito, I'm gonna pose this question to you. The Children's National, at Children's National, Children Nationally is a unique position to address maternal mental health along with the care of newborns and young children. How do you work with a care team to ensure families are able to make the best health decisions for themselves? Thank you for this question. And you're right, as a neonatologist, I care for critically ill newborns, but I'm a pediatrician at heart. So my patients are the, the kids or the babies, but any pediatrician will tell you that the parents are also your patients to some extent. Um, and that looks different in, diff in, in different settings. But in the NICU in particular, um, it is our duty to really help to support parents because they are in crisis. Um, you know, we expect to have a well and healthy newborn baby, but the parents that we are interacting with are, are in crisis mode because their, their infants are, are sick. So I, I have the privilege of working with a, a, a a nice team of physicians, nurses, social workers, and psychologists to really help to address the mental health of our parents in the NICU. Uh, we started by screening parents because as, as I said, these parents are at risk and we know that they're, they're at risk because they're in crisis. So we found that in our NICU at Children's National, one in three parents or three mothers are experiencing elevated symptoms of depression. 
And just to put that into context, in the general public, we usually say about one in 10 mothers will experience postpartum depression. In the NICU, it's one in three. So that, that's a lot, that's a lot. Um, and we know that even at the time of discharge, about 45% of our mothers have elevated symptoms of depression. One of the lessons that I quickly learned during my training at Children's National is that with screening, there are some people that are getting missed. Uh, with screening for depression, it's complicated. I know it's, it's easy, but it's also complicated at the same time because you want to be able to respond immediately if someone is in crisis. So at the moment, our system is to screen parents that are there in person at the bedside of their infant. But that in itself has some iniquities, right? We know that the hospitalization is long. There are some parents that just cannot be there all the time at the bedside for a number of reasons. These social determinants like we talked about. Some parents have to go back to work. They don't have alternative childcare. There are transportation issues. So there, there are some parents that are getting missed. Our goal right now as a team is to really figure out how to get to those parents because they too are certainly at risk even, and I would dare say at more risk for having depression than those parents that, that are um, at the bedside. So at the moment our team is partnering with uh, a company to leverage technology to help to address this, this issue. So we've partnered, we've had some small funding to pilot a partnership with a company called Mama that will allow us to text, to use text message to screen our parents for depression, to provide referral, care coordination, as well as ongoing psychoeducational support. So with that, that is one of the steps that we're taking at the moment to see how can we leverage technology to expand our screening. In addition, we're also, uh, we also had small pilot funding to bring a psychologist into the NICU because that in itself is a barrier. We do, we screen and then we refer parents outpatient, but that, the follow through with that is difficult. So by having a psychologist in the NICU, it's a one-stop shop. The parents can be there with their parents and also get the therapy, and we've also, we're able to leverage technology with this so that we can use telehealth to, to provide the support to parents that can't be at the bedside. So overall, if we can improve the mental health of our parents in the NICU, it will not only be beneficial for, for effective shared decision making with the parents, but it's also very important for once our babies are discharged. We go through a lot of work to really improve the survival of our ill infants, but we are just a small part of that child's life. The parents is really Really who is going to be there to take care of that infant once they're discharged. So addressing their mental health early and effectively is part of our duty in the NICU. Yeah. And so as, as we come to a close, I have one uh, final statement and then I will pose a question um, to each of you quickly. While we know that the awareness of maternal and infant mortality rates is crucial, crucial we also know that we must move beyond awareness to action, and that is moving towards action. As we close, the question I pose to all four of you, what does it look like to move to action to improve outcomes for moms and babies? And Mayor Bowser, I will start with you. Well, um, I, I want to say a little bit more about advocacy. We heard um, Ms. Spicer talk about her advocacy in California, and as I was sitting here, I was thinking that we're in Washington, D.C. This is a national summit, and our Congress right now is not taking action on something important to moms um, and healthy families. And there are probably many things. I know the March of Dimes probably has a long list that you want um, to move forward on. Um, but the president's infrastructure bill focusing on families is one such thing that needs to move um, because it will ensure that people can take care of their families when they need care um, and that child care providers, elder care providers are better trained and better paid. Uh, and one thing we know that moms are doing, if you're a mom like me, you have a little one and you have senior parents and they both need care. I'm in, a, I'm in that sandwich generation where I'm trying to figure out both ends. Um, and uh, we know that we are relying on people to do some of the most important work in our 
in our families, and that's to help the little ones and help seniors when they need more help after they've spent their whole lives working. Why shouldn't people have the dignity of being cared for in their own homes? And so we need to, uh, we need to really be focused on making sure we're making life better uh, for our care providers. So that's one piece of action um, that, that we need to continue to take. I also focus a lot, uh, we have a policy in the district, um, certainly we follow a health in all policies that the Department of Health makes sure that all of the agencies, no matter what they're thinking about, are thinking about the health of our, of our residents. Um, but we follow also a policy called housing first. And largely that term is used when we're talking about ending homelessness. Uh, but it's so important um, when we're talking about any health outcome because people can, be, can make a lot of um, better decisions when they have safe and affordable housing. When they have great housing that's close uh, to groceries, then they can make better health care decisions. Uh, when we have housing in parks and rec that are less than a mile away from uh, every resident is less than a mile away, we can have healthier outcomes. When we can make sure that we have the proper inspectors to go in to make sure that there's no lead paint, uh, we know that our children can enter school healthier. Uh, when we can expand, like we've been able to do, opportunities for people of all incomes to have affordable uh, summer camp opportunities we can have healthier families. So those are the actions um, that as we go into a new budget cycle, where we're investing so much in early childcare, so much uh, in affordable housing, so much in uh, quality grocery in all parts of the city. I know um, that those things will compound. We'll have healthier women, healthier moms, um, and healthier babies. Here we go. Mayor Bowser, advocacy, I think, is the key action step in moving the needle, pushing the needle, pushing the conversation. I, like I said, am an accidental advocate, activist, um, and, but I, we can all do one small thing to help with the health of mothers and babies, particularly the mothers, because that's where my heart lies, um, mostly because if mom is not healthy, no one's healthy around her. You know, moms, when moms thrive, the families thrive. So it's important that if we see something, to do something. You know, I'm using my art with comedy, with my own story, with a documentary film, um, but it's important that if we see a mom struggling, be it at the grocery store, at the gas station, at the car wash, to help a sister out. It is that simple. Um, you know, it's important that moms also see themselves in us as we move throughout the world. So sharing our experiences. You know, when I first had my daughter, I felt like everyone lied to me. I felt like everybody was a liar, that I'd been duped. You know, and that was mostly because the women in my family hadn't shared what their true experiences were like. And so it's important that when women around us who are close to us ex have babies or even thinking about babies, having babies, that we pull them aside and say, okay, it was like this, this might happen. And it's not necessarily giving advice, it's more so advocating for what the experience might or could be like so that they're not left blindsided or feeling like, oh, this is just a me thing. Uh, I also advocate for people to take therapy. Therapy is good, sisters. Black folks, therapy is good. It's a good thing. Get you a therapist. And go to, go to the psych ward. It's a beautiful place, people. <laughs> and it is covered by insurance, OK? $35 a day. Check in. Those are my actionable steps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Jones. So as I've been sitting here listening, um, you know, I'm an obstetrician gynecologist by training. 
I'm clearly a black woman, and I've had the opportunity to have at least half my career working for Johnson & Johnson. And we have at least three projects that I need to share. One is the Equitable Maternal Health Coalition, where we partnered with the American College of OBGYN to establish a coalition, which is now led as a nonprofit by the March of Dimes, to really look at advocacy and policy and where we can make a difference. We were one of the first corporations to support the Momnibus Act. And on a state level, we have a toolkit for state legislators to really to be able to get their states to create the Maternal Mortality Review Committee that will provide the data that we need to take action. You have to have data to act upon. And the Maternal Mortality Review Committees, which are now required for every state, funding's not always available, but the information on how to get it up, out, to get it up and running is something that we have in our toolkit. Another project that we have is called the Georgia Project. In my conversation earlier, I mentioned, you know, the states that have the highest maternal mortality rate here in the United States. Georgia has remained in the top five. It's been one, it's been two, but it's still in the top five. There we have a partnership with several academic institutions, including Morehouse School of Medicine, Emory, Georgia Tech, Georgia State. We have an advisory panel, and we are also partnering with another corporation, with Walmart, to provide blood pressure cuffs and things that a woman would need to be able to monitor herself during a pregnancy. As part of the Georgia project, and we're also partnered with um, the I believe it's the Black Mamas uh, Coalition there. We are also looking at things like telehealth and technology and how we can bring them to this community and how they can benefit. And everything we do is research-based, that's who we are. So whenever we're doing something, we're collecting data that can be used. And then third, but not last at all, is a project that I'm personal leading, personally leading which is called the Hack for Equity. And it's a hackathon for the health equity of black mamas in Georgia. What's so powerful about it is that it's not just a technology solution. And I know those of you familiar with hackathon, that's how you always think of that word in hacking. It has to be tech. But it's also an ideathon. There will be winners selected. There will be cash prizes awarded. Participates, the participants are anticipated to be professionals, students, and when I say professionals, it's entrepreneurs, it's public health professionals, it's medical clinicians, it's academicians, and then of course, as I mentioned, it's our students. And the solutions to the problems are problems in Georgia, but that can be extrapolated across the United States. And our entire Georgia project really is seen as a pilot as to how we can make change and how we can impact the policies and the way healthcare is provided here in the United States for our black mothers. That is so important because mothers lead everything and people who do the mothering lead everything. And we want to keep them healthy. There is no reason that the United States, as a black woman, you are more likely to die from your pregnancy than any other race or ethnicity here in the United States, and just in general, any other developed country in the world. Um, thank you. That was very well said. It's hard to follow that. <laughs> um, I guess I'll take it from the perspective of a clinician. How can we go from awareness to action? Um, and I really encourage all of my colleagues or anyone that has interfaced with patients at the bedside. I think it really starts from within. I think we need to ask ourselves some hard questions. What role am I playing in perpetuating some of these health disparities? I think we really need to acknowledge and recognize, identify our own implicit biases. What decisions am I making that is making the issue worse? 
There are actual tests that you can take that will help uncover some of your subconscious stereotypes. I encourage all of my colleagues to take them uh, because it's very telling. And then constantly recognizing that whenever you're in that scenario as a clinician, recognizing your biases and really encouraging yourself to make decisions based on your better clinical judgment as opposed to your subconscious stereotypes. I think as a clinician, we also need to take the onus on us to build trust with our patients. When there's no trust, our patients are not gonna follow through with the recommend recommendations, which will have long-term impact on the health outcomes. Um, I think the clinicians, we need to take the responsibility to understand the historical context of this mistrust. It's not up to the patient to explain it to us. We can do that homework. Google is available to everyone. So you can Google it. Why is there mistrust in certain communi communities and the healthcare system? I think that is up to us to really build and have an open communication with our, with our patients. So certainly I think in, it's one thing to be aware, it's the next step to take some actions. And I think that these are some really important steps that clinicians need to take. And I think just overall as a healthcare system, we need to continue to encourage these types of dialogue. As we said, the, the social determinants of health really have a big impact on many of these health disparities that we've discussed. These, we need to get out of the walls of the hospital and really build on these partnerships within the community. And I just wanna put that plug out there that at Children's National, we're committed to this work. We're open to these partnerships and if anyone is, is also equally like-minded and ready to get to work, we are too, as well at Children's. Thank you. And so Mayor Bowser, what I'll say to you is thank you for your leadership Thank you for the work that your administration is doing in this space. We commend you. I want to thank our wonderful distinguished panelists um, for their comments. Everyone has kind of shared with you where we are, what we can do, and the action that everyone in this room can take. Thank you all for joining us today.